This is Musings of the Shy Podcast. I'm your host, Rosia Shy. Episode 121. One's philosophy is not best expressed in words. It's expressed in the choices one makes. And the choices we make are ultimately our responsibility. This is the philosophy of Bitcoin. So let's get into this. Um, before we begin our discussion, there's a couple things I want to cover about the philosophy of Bitcoin, if you will. Um, the philosophy, in a sense, not of Bitcoin, but the community itself, of the different various groups that have been um, influenced, if you will, or inspired by the creation of Bitcoin and have come into this space with their already existing um, political thoughts or viewpoints or philosophy on life. And this is, has an impact on the community. It's created the community to be very robust, very dynamic, if you will. There's different perspectives that are... Uh, all aiming for the same type of goal, but have a different lens or, you know, gaze on what to do or the different types of solutions, which is why you see, and it, particularly within, I would say, the last four or five months, an increase of different types of solutions to address the core problem. And I'll address the core problem in a moment. But the purpose is just kind of give an idea of the dynamic, um, an understanding of the community as a whole and why the problem that we're facing right now um, why it probably kind of exists, why there's just different types of solutions, and why we're currently kind of in a bit of a stalemate. So what is the problem? The problem is, uh, let's kind of go back a little bit in history, when Satoshi Nakamoto first launched the white paper. Uh, the white paper uh, launched in 2008 was in a reaction, if you will, to the global collapse that happened, from you know, which started in 2006 and went on to technically, as they say, to 2009. And so he launched his white paper, his solution, um, Bitcoin, you know, digital cash, if you will. And he was seeking to help individuals to create their own personal wealth. Now, he's not the first one to come up with this type of solution. There has been other, other systems that have existed prior to that, and some of them have inspired... Um, uh, not only had to ins- uh, inspired the creation of Bitcoin, but certain uh, protocols or aspects have been woven into the Bitcoin protocol in itself because of these previous attempts. But um, basically what it comes down to was a, you know, it's going to become the internet of money, the ability for people to, around the world, no matter whom they are, no matter what level or class they are, if they have a connection to the internet, they'll be able to have a control of their individual wealth. They're not going to be subjugated to the uh, corruption and the uh, will of different governmental systems, um, just the atrocious nature that our current financial system is, our global financial system is. And this was proposed by Satoshi Nakamoto as a solution to that. And with the launch of the code in 2009, uh, it has grown since. And one aspect of the code is the very nature of the blockchain in itself is the, um, as we covered in previous episodes, um, is the block size. So the block size, um, as you know, um, but if you're still unfamiliar, um, the block size is where all the transactions that people send across the, the network, the miners take that, take that information and put it into the block. And then shoot it out into the network as confirmation. It's confirming that this transaction has happened as acceptance that you sent your, you know, your $125 worth of Bitcoin from, you know, Alice to Bob. But the size of it is one megabyte, which is, if you think about it in the world where there's USB sticks that are a couple ter- terabytes of, the, you know, hard drives of information, uh, pictures, you know. Especially these uh, HD pictures, you know, are way beyond one megabyte. It's not quite a lot of information if you think about it. But it worked for the longest time. And it didn't start as a one megabyte. Uh, I think um, that's something if you're new to Bitcoin or cryptocurrency in general, uh, maybe something you haven't delved into personally if you've been here a long time. The one megabyte limit that is a block size and the, and the subject and the the kind of sourness is happening into the, the cryptocurrency community in general, but Bitcoin in particular, um, that wasn't originally the case. It was, it was much larger. Uh, there wasn't a cap, but it was capped for technical reasons because as the, 
the community was very nascent. Um, it was getting attacked. It wasn't as robust as it is now. Uh, I was getting hit by spam attacks, by DO, DO, uh, DOS attacks. Uh, so the network was subject to all these different types of attacks. And one of the ways to prevent that was um, lowering the block size so that the network could grow, so the network could become more robust as a counterpoint to these type of attacks. And then eventually, as the network grew, you can then raise that limit to fit the needs of the volume of transactions that are happening on the network uh, to that current network size. And that hasn't quite happened yet. Um, the one megabyte limit was set, I believe, in 2013. We are now in 2017. Uh, it is always perceived as a, um, a temporary measure. Uh, the, block, the block size in itself, there was a roadmap or proposal that by 2016 it was supposed to increase. It hasn't happened. There's been different types of solutions to address that, from the Lightning Network to the Segwick, to uh, B Core, to Bitcoin Unlimited, uh, to Softworks. All these different types of solutions have been proposed to not only address the, the the block size, but the transaction fees. Is really what it comes down to. Is the transaction fees are getting higher and higher and higher to where the fundamental core of Bitcoin in itself, and even this is a bit of an issue, and we'll kind of, when we talk about the different philosophy groups, you can kind of see why this has become a, a perspective issue, a lens issue, if you will. Uh, digital cash, of it being used as a transactional unit across the internet for buying goods and services. So, for example, some people consider buying a $5 um, amount of coffee, on-chain as, it call, as it's called, um, that's something you shouldn't be doing. They think that Bitcoin should be a store value unit for your wealth and you should be holding it and not really spending it so much to say, but to hold it for future generational wealth purposes or just holding it in general to while it increase in value and build off from there. Which is nice, you know, to have a nice savings, if you will, or potential future investment. But the primary function of Bitcoin in itself is to both also be a store of value, but cash, to use it as money on the internet for whatever that transaction is, whether it's buying coffee, some comic books, some shoes, or a house. And all these transactions are supposed to be treated equally. And it's quite not the case because you may be able to purchase a house and say a house is like, I don't know, you got a sweet deal, it's 150 k and you're able to purchase it with Bitcoin. Well, that transaction fee might calculate, and I'm not going to go calculate, so please don't at me. Um, just for example, that whole 150k sent to the realtor was only five bucks. Okay, but if you wanted to spend five bucks on coffee, you know the way the transaction fees are going, it might cost you a dollar to send that five bucks. Five dollars on a 150k transaction fee is very nominal if you think about it, but a fifth of the value of the item you're spending for a dollar to have your transaction mined to be validated is a lot. And considering that the majority of all financial transactions, whether it be uh, on Bitcoin or just in the world in general, anything below 20 bucks is considered microtransactions. It just is. There's a reason why when you go to certain stores and um, they won't let you swipe your credit card unless you spend ten dollars or more uh, they won't swipe even your debit card unless you spend five dollars or more because they don't want to eat the cost of the, the debit transaction um, i remember there was an incident uh, for me personally a couple years ago and i think i spoken about it on the show um where i tried to buy a burrito and they wouldn't let let me pay for it with my debit card because it was exactly a uh, dollar seven, and they didn't accept any of those type of low transactions. I had to buy another item for two dollars, or they wouldn't accept it. And I've never been back to that place again. And it's a, ma a major franchise place, a food place. Actually, I don't think it was a dollar seven. That was a different place. I think it was like it was like a seventy nine cent burrito, just a nice little quick eat plus tax. It came out like to like eat less than 89 cents. I think it might have even been 89 cents or something like that because there might have been a, a town or a city uh, tax attached to that as well. And I couldn't do it because it was less than a dollar. I had to buy something else. And I was like, no. <laughs> and so I walked out. That, that was ridiculous. I couldn't spend 89 cents. 
And so Bitcoin was supposed to be a solution to that. Bitcoin was supposed to be a solution to where I could do microtransactions, where I can spend five bucks, ten bucks, uh, four bucks on the internet, uh, tip people, or in the case of yours, which is one of those contact producers plus Steemit and a couple other places are seeking to do those type of microtransaction type of deals. Yours is still a beta. Steemit has his own type of crypt, you know, cryptocurrency where it's like a you have Steemit coins and you can switch it out to Bitcoin. So you probably you purchase Bitcoin to purchase Steemit and then you take the Steemit and you give it to people. It's I haven't really looked into it, but it's a, it's a little bit different from yours. Where yours is just taking um, Bitcoin straight up. Um, right now they have a test thing, and I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes where you can basically read a blog post, and if you want to read the whole thing, send one cent in Bitcoin, or um, another one I think is ten cents. So this is a way for you to pay content or pay to a contributor or anything like that. I think like a couple years back, Shooter Jennings sold one of his signals for 10 cents to hear his new song. That's significant. That really is significant. Um, and the ability to part away with your money in that fashion is important. Um, I think another thing that you'll see in this debate that people kind of forget was the the very act of Satoshi Nakamoto uh, proposing his paper is one thing. People propose all sorts of types of technical white papers all the time. But actually putting it into the world uh, was a political act. The ability to create cryptocurrency, the ability to cre- create a, a monetary system that's outside the, the preview of the government that is not um, any government or any centralized banking system didn't create themselves um, with their approval is unheard of. Uh, every time anyone's attempted to do this, has been shut down and tossed in prison. And this is the first system that's not only escaped a lot of that significant scrutiny. And don't get me wrong, they're they're trying to regulate it almost to death in some cases, in some instances. But it's the first system that has successfully done that, has escaped that, and is robust. It has a strong protocol. Protocol has a strong community. It's very dynamic. Uh, scattered throughout the world and it works so you sometimes see this when talking about the block size debate where people are saying it's not political it's take politics out of it and you and i think they're missing the point um, some are trying to be very abstract uh, some companies are not having a say on the, the block size debate at all because uh, they don't think it's their place to say anything really and I think that everyone's kind of missing the point. Just the very nature of Bitcoin, the very nature of cryptocurrency in general is political. And so all actions associated with it are political. doesn't mean that all actions put into it or output it should be political, but it does color it. It does flavor the sauce, if you will. And I think that's another thing that's a hiccup within the space in itself because people are trying to be apolitical and trying to be very... Um, neutral in this and in the proposals and solutions and the solutions that are being um, put forth to the community and the ones that are being supported and it, it doesn't doesn't quite fly and I think that's why it's, there's a lot of stalemate um, within the community in itself because no one wants to acknowledge that this is a uh, it's almost a political as well as an economic movement that's a couple other things here before we get into it I think that pretty much covers it. You know, the heart of the whole block size debate is the raising of the block size of from from one megabyte to a, diff, a different amount to to deal with the current network size because uh, the blocks are getting filled and it's becoming a little bit cumbersome. Uh, what is it? Uh, sometimes block uh, sometimes transactions are getting rejected by the miners because you know the miners are the ones that put. The transactions in the block, the block is verified. You know that's how your your transactions are getting confirmed and then push out into the network uh, to be confirmed and validated by the nodes as well as being you know this is happening on the this is what the blockchain looks like. Um, I'm trying to keep it very simple. What you're seeing is um, the transaction fees are getting pretty high for a lot of people. Um, granted, there's nominal to everything else, I guess you can say, but. For something that's supposed to be digital cash, something that's supposed to be for sovereign wealth, if you will, for the individual wealth, that's supposed to be the internet money, a dollar transaction fee for a $5 transaction is 
ridiculous. So that's why we're kind of at a bit of a stalemate is why people are getting a little frustrated, a little irritated. Um, there hasn't been really much updates and progress within the code in itself, the protocol. Other cryptocurrencies have come into the space. Um, some people consider this um, a bad thing. I personally don't. Uh, but they are increasing their size of people utilizing their, their, their particular crypto coin. You know, Ethereum, Litecoin, as we talked about at the top of the news. Um, because it is a fork of Bitcoin. Or not necessarily a fork, but a clone of Bitcoin. They're able to put in one of the proposed solutions into their into their network as a way of addressing their own future potential transaction issues. Um, they're a little bit faster and they have a little bit bigger block size than Bitcoin, but potentially their network would eventually face that same um, Bitcoin problem with their blocks being full and transaction fees being high. And and, maybe, and one of the solutions SegWit or Segregated Witness is supposed to mitigate that. Um, it's in, within six days, as we talked about at the top of the news, um, it's going to be activated and we're going to see whether or not that's actually going to work. But let's get into it. Let's get into the philosophies. Um, again, one of the reasons why Bitcoin was created was because it was addressing the global collapse and the corruption and just our current economic system, the global system that we have. That's why Satoshi Nakamoto proposed his white paper, why he did the initial code. And we are here um, um, today within the community. But he didn't, you know, he didn't create this out of a void. He didn't, you know, wasn't like, you know, he was Zeus and Athena just pop off the top of his head. Um, This came from something. And one of the things that came from, one of the philosophies that influenced the creation, and one of the biggest groups that you can say, and there's a lot of intersectionality of the various different groups that we'll talk about, was cypherpunks. Um, If you've heard that name, it's because um, it's been bantering around a lot when discussing privacy issues with the internet, the way that the last, I would say, three administrations here in the States, governments in general, the way the corporations want to sell your browsing history, the erosion in general of privacy. Uh, There is a group that advocated very early on in the very uh, early days of the internet that wanted to address uh, the issue of not only privacy, but um, individual freedoms and keeping you know, governments or corporations out of the everyday, day-to-day business of individuals. So here's this article called Cyber Salon that kind of breaks down the cypherpunk movement. I'm just going to skim the key points and then get to the heart of uh, Bitcoin itself. It doesn't state who wrote this article. Cypherpunk is concerned solely with a hidden meaning and secrets and power that can be wielded out of sight from governments and spooks. It's embodied by the discrete arrays of public-private key pairs. It's a science that values discretion and privacy above all else, and such champions are most closely held secrets and beliefs. So out of the cypherpunk movement, um, we got these kind of different types of ideas. You know, cypherpunks, you know, help influence RSA, PGP, uh, they're one of the reasons why, um, what was that proposal? Uh, there was a hardware proposal that was supposed to be attached to every single phone in existence uh, that these guys advocated shutting it down. Uh, they found out about it, and it was the clipper. It was a clipper chip. And members of this group, it started back, all the way back in 1990, in the 90s, have gone on and created um, different types of programs, different organizations have been um, influencers within the technology space on advocating for privacy and individual freedom. So uh, they began properly in 1992 when Tim May, Eric Hughes, and John Gilmore started this cypherpunk mailing list. But uh, Jim Bell, David Chum, Phil Zimmerman, Julia Assange, um, Adam Back, and we'll die and how feeding are just few of the ciphers on the mailing list who are now becoming luminaries because they've contributed something so unique valuable to us through their efforts to protect our privacy and the new information economy, particularly against the encroaching encroaching financial surveillance complex. So for example, Julian Assange is responsible for WikiLeaks, Adam Back created Hashcash, uh, We'd Die. Uh, he also came up with his own 
uh, concepts for uh, peer-to-peer cash, how Feeney helped contribute to the Bitcoin um, cryptocurrency code. He's also one of the first people to receive Bitcoin from Satoshi Nakamoto himself. Uh, Phil Zimmerman is responsible for PGP. And David Chum also had his own peer-to-peer stuff. So these guys helped contribute to the concept of privacy. Uh, other names like Tim Beerleaves, the man responsible for the World Wide Web. Nick Sabo is another contributor to the Bitcoin space. And John Perry Barlow. Um, they're considered cypherpunks by proxy because their their contributions and their philosophies on privacy and individual rights. Um, Tim May came up uh, with the cypherpunk anarchist manifesto. Eric Hughes came up with the cypherpunk manifesto as well. They also contribute to the cypherconian. Uh, we're not going to read it at the moment, but we'll eventually address it on a word from the metaverse. But just kind of, there's a little snippet that's within the article that I think is important important that comes from the cryptomanian these are like manifestos that influence the space um cypher Comian, which was uh, by neil stevenson was set in the 90s with characters employing crypto logic telecom and computer technology to build an underground data heaven their goal was to facilitate anonymous internet banking using electronic money and later digital gold currency so that was the purpose of you know cyberpunk down uh david chum was the most notable early champion of the cyberpunks goal realistically a digital currency in digicash that's something that he came up with uh, came out in the 90s late 90s early aughts in some ways digicash was a spectacular failure something unfamiliar attributed to chum's greed but the best way is failures were instructive because it demonstrated perfectly that a privately issued digital currency could not survive the legal systems onslaught of uh, regulations like aml and kyc in particular Exactly the same story has been said being played out again and again with Eagle's failure, whose CEO Douglas uh, Jackson narrowly avoided being sent to jail, more recently with Liberty Reserve Dollar and Arthur Bugassi's arrest. So these guys, their underlying concept, and um, I'm going to read a little bit from Tim May's Crypto Anarchist Manifesto, influenced the concept of peer-to-peer cash, of internet cash and privacy and controlling your own particular wealth um identity you know true names uh, that people are building with the blockchain was something that was discussed and banter around through this mailing list so computer technology on the verge of providing the ability for individuals and groups to communicate and interact with each other in a totally anonymous manner anonymity again something that bitcoin initially was proposed or conceived to be but it's more pseudo anonymous this has been proven with the uh blockchains as floors and the blockchain spies and the Blockchain being public, that's why the you know we have Zcash, Monero, Dash, other types of cryptocurrencies have come up. Uh, two persons may exchange messages, conduct business, and negotiate electronic contracts, smart contracts, without ever knowing the true names or legal identity of the other. Interactions over the network will be untraceable with nearly perfect assurance against any tampering. Reputation will be of essential importance, far more important than dealings and even the credit ratings of today. These developments will alter completely the nature of government regulation, the ability to tax and control economic interactions, and the ability to keep information secret, and even alter the nature of trust and reputation. Uh, these guys were also very um, anti-tax as well. And then the Cyberpunk Manifesto from Eric Hughes. Um, cyberpunks are dedicated to building anonymous systems. Privacy is necessary for an open society in the electronic age. We cannot expect governments, corporations, or other large Faceless organizations are granted privacy. We must defend our privacy if we expect to have any. We are defending our privacy with cryptography, with anonymous mail mail forwarding systems, with digital signatures, and electronic money. So this particular movement and these previous failures heavily influenced in the concept and the protocol that is the creation of Bitcoin. And it's the this idea, if you will, that has been out there and propagating and people have been debating, uh, debating and going back and forth on how to implement it. And people have tried is the reason, you know, that not only is Bitcoin exists and shows you Nakamoto was able to develop it, but it has its own little, um, all these different types of movements that have, that have gravitated to it because of its, because again, very political nature to be able to be anonymous, to be able to be private, to be able to transact without any anyone knowing about it, surveillance. And, you know, in an essence, to step away from the current system that exists right now. So... The, the cypherpunk movement, which heavily influenced Satoshi Nakamoto's creation of Bitcoin, is kind of like a layer, a foundational layer 
for Bitcoin in itself. And from that, from that, you have like the first adopters and users uh, being early participants of the cypherpunk movement or um, influence, heavily influenced the movement, working on the code. And we'll talk about the people that contribute to the code on the other guys. But the the gravitation for different types of political forces, uh, political communities and groups um, that we'll get into in the next segment, you can understand that that base layer um, of influence, that flavor, if you will, is what gravitated people to, to the Bitcoin space beyond just um, the great um, concept of it in of itself of being, um, the, you know, online uh, just requires a connection to be able to participate. Uh, there is no barriers as far as, um, you know, AML or KYC or user identities. Uh, you can um, participate at your will or level of will if you want. You can have a, you can, you can download the code. It's open source. Uh, the blockchain in itself is public. You see all the transactions. Uh, so you can know that um, what is occurring on the network. Uh, you can do things like you can download a node, you can be a miner if you choose to be, uh, you can build off of it, uh, you can contribute to it, and we'll talk about that on the next episode when we talk about BIP. Um, all these different things because it's um, open source, because it's decentralized, there's no centralized authority, uh, because it's an open source code that you can, anyone can put on any type of computer with an internet connection and participate in the network. Uh, this makes it decentralized and because it's open source you can fork it and create your own cryptocurrency if you want to and because of that dynamic because it seeks to be um, a monetary system that is not centralized is not issued by anybody uh, all these different types of forces are gravitating into it taxation you know, could be an issue if you will and because of that because of that you have all these different groups coming into it, influenced by the the base layer if you will seeing aspects or elements of that base layer something of them in themselves in it um that's why you see sometimes like where people get very upset with exchanges because they become mla or kyc know your customers which has just recently happened with the chinese exchanges they weren't like that before but now they are uh, that's why you see the rise of BitSquare and other decentralized peer-to-peer exchanges. Um, is why you see people advocating for, you know, don't take your cryptocurrency out of the system, you know, ch- exchange it out for fiat, try to keep it crypto to crypto, uh, try to find ways to maintain and keep your cryptocurrency and try to close the loop so you won't have to be dependent on the financial system. Um, as we've discussed um, in the Silk Road Marketplace about the exchanges and those series of episodes, we talked about how wire transfers were being uh, shut down, how that is a problem for a lot of exchanges. A lot of exchanges uh, went out of business because they couldn't become um, AMLI, AMLL and know your customer compliant. Um, they couldn't maintain or keep their um, bank accounts with various uh, banking infrastructures so there was no way for them to operate the exchange you have local bitcoin there's been a few cases um, where individuals have been arrested for selling their bitcoins to undercover officers Um, some of those cases should play out whether or not they're going to be found guilty or not guilty in the next couple of months if you see so there's ways that the governmental systems are trying to shut down this cryptocurrency system, and you can see why people are like, well, don't participate in this way in using Bitcoin, or don't use Coinbase because they track your your coins. Um, they can shut down your account. There's fundamental. They can contribute to the whole issue of fungibility, where there's certain coins are more valuable than others. Um, there's the issue of you know not wanting to give your government. You know, your information out there for the government to know about. Um, I think we talked about it during the Silk Road Marketplace how like 864 people have uh, reported to the U.S. government as their tax tax information when it comes to um, cryptocurrency. So there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of different ways that people are perceived of 
or have a perspective about you know the using of Bitcoin and which is contributing to the kind of the stalemate and the tension within the community when it comes to these type of solutions. How do you want Bitcoin to be used? How do you want to use the currency? How do you want to um, participate? You know, do should it be very regulatory compliant? Should it be centralized? Is decentralized the method that we should be utilizing? Um, all these different things, and because of that baseline base uh, line flavoring, if you will, of the influence of cyberpunks to the concept of Bitcoin, this is why you get these other different philosophy groups and how they view um, Bitcoin and, and and how they think these different solutions should work. I also have linked here under this segment um, uh, different concepts and proposals and viewpoints about Bitcoin. There are great articles to read. One in particular is the viewpoint about, again, holding Bitcoin. And it goes to the whole concept of, do uh, you think Bitcoin should be a digital cash or a um, way of holding um, value of wealth? That is a value of wealth unit and not a digital cash system. And so there's a lot that people that just like, they just hold their Bitcoin and been holding it forever, whether they mine it directly or purchase it when it's very low and laugh at people when they either sell their Bitcoin or use their Bitcoin or like, well, I'm just going to hold it forever and never, never give it up. And yes, those individuals help create value to the Bitcoin because the less uh, Bitcoins are out there in circulation, you know, the more increases more the value of Bitcoin in of itself. But at the same time, if you're not using it, if no one's using it and everyone's holding then what's the purpose of it? How does it have any type of real value? You can hold it all day and night and day and night, and one day maybe you might dump it or use it, but people aren't going to wait for maybes and and one day. You're just going to move on to the next thing, something the better that people can, has actual true complete function, if you will. Okay, so let's get into the, the type of groups that are participating um, in the cryptocurrency space that were inspired by Bitcoin itself, by the white paper, by the, the kind of little foundational layer, the little streak of cypherpunk them where they advocating for privacy and uh, controlling your own wealth and maybe a little tax evasion in there, if you will. But fundamentally not participating in the existing overall structure that we, we currently have. Um, moving away from that, if you will, which is what, which which is what Bitcoin is, is moving away from the current financial structure. And so, cypherpunkdom is about creating a space that's completely divorced from the already existing current uh, systems, the political system, the governmental systems, uh, the current societal systems, divorcing itself completely and operating and being on. The best communication device that we currently have developed, which is the internet. Okay, so this is about last month that this came out. It's from uh, Tutana. Tutana is one of those uh, privacy emails, you know, paid services that seeks to protect your privacy from um, everyone and anything. Uh, they don't keep your information or anything like that. Everything is kind of encrypted. Everything's done on the back end. I highly recommend it. I have a Tutana uh, uh, email. Um, address, if you will. Um, also, most of my emails are in Proton Mail, but um, yeah, it's one of those strong privacy advocate uh, email services. And uh, eventually, I will have a uh, comparison show between Tatana, Proton Mail, and uh, Wava Bit um, on the um, Herosia Thought Bubble. Uh, but for now, this is a, their statement, and it's concerning the FCC, which right now. Um, the FCC is accepting uh, comments on their new um, repeal efforts for net neutrality. So I highly encourage you, and I'll put a link in the show notes, to make a comment towards Congress about net neutrality and not having it repealed. Uh, but here's Tutana's statement. On April 3rd, 2017, President Trump signed a bill 
which was designed to cut all of the FCC's protective laws for customer and internet use in the U.S. This action effectively opened the floodgates for advertisers and increased the reach of government procurement on data generated by private citizens. Unfortunately, in many other countries, the loss of privacy is already a common fact of life. With corporate giants and government entities finding new ways to spy on private citizens, there seems to be a dark void where peace and personal rights should be, leaving consumers the world over smiling nervously at their ISPs and wireless providers, like the burial sheep with the wolf that promises to guard them. Internet privacy is a defense. Personal information such as bank accounts, passwords, online purchases, dating sites, and social media choices all have to go through an ISP, which puts all their personal information to an unfeeling corporate hands. Privacy protects consumers from invasive ads. It also protects consumers' children from advertisers that will profile and target them as they grow up. Privacy stops criminal activity. Yahoo's multiple experience with hacked email accounts serve as a prime example. Hacks that range from large to massive in terms of the amount of personal information that was stolen from trusted private citizens, all without their knowledge. This latest hack involved 1 billion Yahoo accounts that were accused by a hacker who allegedly gained interest through a rootkit that the Yahoo allowed the U.S. government to install for the purpose of government spying. Privacy is a human right. Most people don't want their next-door neighbors spying on them, much less their government. Privacy stops the invasive spying of a government, any government. Without instant internet access to private details on the citizen's life, governments have to go through legal channels that provide citizens with the protection and the law of the land. This is equal true for the children the governments and advertisers spy on, starting as early as the age of five. Internet privacy protection pro- parties in legal agreement. Many online professional work under non-disclosure agreements, NDA. These agreements protect developing businesses from the completion, from competition, and they, they are entered into with a personal integrity on all sides. Web developers, content writers, mobile app creators, and more all work under these legal binding contracts. Some projects can stretch to well over the six-month or one-year marks, giving any ISP plenty of time to collect it a lot of information from browsing histories, including private information covered under an NDA. Once those NDAs are broken, the professional reputation and livelihood are at risk stake. Online privacy is safety. As consumers read about our experience new threats to their identities and finances, their privacy has become more precious, taking on a new sense of importance. Many times it is the privacy or the lack of information that protects them from internet crimes. This is equally true for victims of internet-initiated attacks in which personal identifiable information was garnered through online accounts. The wolf that guards personal information. No matter how consumer-friendly a company appears to be, it is a corporation that is a business to make money. Consumers, it's money-based, and any corporation can be guilty of making money at the expense of its consumers, endangering the privacy it vows to protect. While data is the currency of the 21st century, all ISPs, wireless carriers, and online businesses should be viewed with the same trust any sheep would give a wolf, especially if the laws favor them over private citizens. Consumers can still take action to protect themselves, like using encrypted email services, searching under VPNs, and surfing through private search engines. All these tools will provide a measure of anonymity, but internet users should always be careful. The fight for internet security is still being fought, but the battle has been, hasn't been won just yet. The above article was written by and used by an enthusiastic uh, Tonto user who refers to stay anonymous. We thank him or her for sharing our passion for privacy and also for writing such an awesome article for our blog. We are certain that together we can fight for privacy. In another bit of news, um, Jimmy Wales, um, the uh, co-founder and creator of Wikipedia, uh, Wikipedia founder, to fight fake news with a new Wicca Tribune site. Uh, this comes from The Guardian. A crowdfunded online publication from, from Jimmy Wells will pair a paid journalist with an army of volunteer contributors. This was published like April 24th. So uh, Jimmy Wells, um, and it was written by Alex Hearn. Uh, Jimmy Wells, a co-founder of Wikipedia, is launching a new online publication which will aim to fight fake news by pairing professional journalists with any an army of volunteer community contributors. Wicked Tribune plans to pay for reporters by raising money from a crowdfunding campaign. Wales intends to cover general issues such as U.S. and U.K. politics through to specialized science and technologies. Those who donate will become supporters who in turn will have a say in which subjects and story threads the site focuses on. And Wales intends that the community of readers will fact-check and sub-edit published articles. Describing uh, Wicked Tribune as a news by the people and for the people, Wales said. 
This will be the first time the professional journalist and citizen journalist will work side by side as equals, writing stories as they happen, editing them live as they develop, and at all times backed by a community checking, rechecking all facts. Although though the site is launching it at the beginning of the UK general election campaign, Wells says the impetus of the project came from the US. Someone I knew convinced me to give Trump uh, 100 days before making my mind up, he said. But then on the day one, Kelly Ann Conway came out and said her alternative stack line. And that's when I decided to move forward. If the fundraising campaign goes well, hopes to be able to hire the site's first journalist as soon as possible, perhaps before June 8th, when Britain's vote in the general election called by Prime Minister uh, Theresa May. Uh, currently, right now, France is in the middle of their own election, presidential election, and there's been a lot of months muzzling in and fake news, um, as well as uh, Russian influence um, badgering around in that particular election. Uh, like Wikipedia, Wales' new project will be free to access. The publication is launching on Tuesday, April uh, 25th, with a crowdfunding campaign, pre-selling monthly support packages to fund the initial journalists. The first issue will soon follow soon after. The community contributors will pay a key will key part in the new site, ensuring that the content of the articles is always supported by as much extra information shared with the reader as possible. They will be backed by the presumption of transparency in the site's reporting, with journalists sharing full transcripts, video, and audio of interviews. He hopes the combination of the distributed intelligence of Wikipedia and measured professional journalism driven by a business model that's not about chasing clicks will lead to a news organization built from the ground up to com combat fake news and political rabble-rousing. There's a third way, he said, between the two models of, of he says, he, she said, facts, neutrality, or having a Paul Dicer, editor of the Daily Mail, and Janet and ramming things down our throats. He added, if you take a look at Wikipedia, it's noisy and not a perfect place, but for true fake news, there's been almost no impact on the Wikipedia community. The volunteers are experienced enough to know it's nonsense and have an ethos that says, no, we're here for neutral facts. The community knows it from the ground up. Those contributors who also support the site financially will eventually be able to advise on topics they want Wikipedia to explore, Wells says. If you take as an example the Bitcoin community, they're a very active and obsessed community. There's a lot of news that comes out in the field, and I think they would love to be able to raise money to hire journalists and put them on the Bitcoin blockchain beat. The idea behind uh, Wikipedia is similar to other experiments with sustainable community journalism. A uh, Dutch news website, uh, Des Correspondent, for instance, is, was launched in 2013 after a million dollar crowdfunding, a uh, million and, uh, pounds uh, crowdfunding campaign, or actually it's a million in euro and 850,000 pounds, with a goal of focusing on reported led in depth coverage of select few, few topic, topics backed up by a strong involvement from a community of financial backers. In March, the site announced a push in the U.S. market funded by 515,000 in U.S. dollars, 400,000 in pounds, grant from a number of digital news charities. But Wales thinks that such com compromises, such comparisons do wick the German down. I'm not sure that anyone's ever been as radical as I am, he said. Realistic in terms of saying the community can really have control, a lot of people from digital newsrooms have, ha have really had trouble getting their head around that. Wales, who sits on the board of the Guardian Media Group, the Guardian's parent company, founded Wikipedia with Larry Sanger in 2001 before donating the entire project to a non-profit organization, the Wikimedia Foundation, that he set up in, tw in 2003. He remains a board, member of the Wiki a board member of the Wikimedia Foundation and is the president of Wicca, a Wikipedia spinoff that allows communities to make their own collaborated edited encyclopedias on topics ranging from top Top Gear to Harry Potter. So that's something new. It would be interesting to see how it uh, flourishes or sails or falls apart or any of that type of deal. Uh, it initially was up um, April 26th. Right now, uh, they have 20 days to go. They have 8,925 supporters. They have, um, they have this thing on the top uh, when you go to their website, 5 slash 10 journalists funded. So far, they've... Uh, funded uh, five journalists, and it just has a complete breakdown of what they're seeking to do here. I wonder if they will be uh, adding any components like um, any de decentralized uh, services, whether it's IEFF or um, I2P or Tor or um, 
storage is a cloud service if they will truly go into a kind of really radical direction if you will i will link to the wicked turban in the show notes wrap up the news here which uh, we're done and we're going to talk about uh, the fullness of this episode which is about the philosophy of so here are the highlights of some of the different types of groups that were drawn to Bitcoin. I'm just going to kind of read the Wicca synopsis, just to kind of give an idea of all the various people and ideas that brought people to uh, Bitcoin. And you can understand why there's such a contentious atmosphere when it comes to um <clears throat> The raising of the block size. So you have volunteerists, uh, which we will do a uh, an episode of volunteerism on um, a word of the metaverse. We'll do like a, an in depth look at um, that philosophy because that particular philosophy, more than um, some of the, the other ones that we'll mention here, uh, really had a significant impact on cypherpunks, but a lot of open source projects and developers for a lot of the um, technology that we u- utilize today, a lot of the different programs like Linux, um, BitTorrent, uh, any peer-to-peer project, you will often hear some kind of echo of volunteerism or an outright statement about volunteerism in any... Um, interview of a developer or maybe the manifesto or about page of a particular project. So the fundamentals of volunteerism. This comes from the volunteerist.com. Volunteerism is a doctrine that relations relations among people should be mutually consent or not at all. It represents a means and end and an insight. Volunteerism does not argue for the specific form that volunteer arrangements will take Only that force be abandoned so that individuals in society may flourish. As it is the means which determine the end, the goal of all volunteer society must be sought voluntarily. People cannot be coerced into freedom, hence the use of a free market, education, persuasion, and nonviolent resistance as the primary ways to change people's ideas about the state. The volunteers' insights that all tyranny and government are grounded upon popular acceptance explains why volunteer means are sufficient to attain that end. So you can understand how people of this mindset would be drawn to Bitcoin because of the nature of a decentralized system. All you need is a connection to connect to um, the blockchain, allow you to uh, send, receive, mine, um, develop, especially in the very initial onset of Bitcoin, there was more of a collaborative effort to work on the Bitcoin code, which we'll talk about in the next episode when we talk about BIP and the development of that and what BIP is. But you can understand, like I stated, that this this effort, the open source nature of Bitcoin, um, the peer to peer nature would draw people that are volunteers because in order to participate in Bitcoin, you have to choose to be. It's not a government mandate. Um, you're not coerced or forced to participate in this type of system. You choose to be part of it and you choose the level of participation, um, the nature of your participation and the degree of your participation. And you also have a say on how others participate in the sense that if you can convince others to either develop a, a certain kind of upgrade, if you will, which is the heart of the whole, um, block um, block size debate then you do so with your the, your ideas you don't do so by just forcing it if you will and saying well that's the law and take it or leave it um, then you have objectivity objectivity is a central philosoph- philosophical co- concept now this is coming from wicca related to reality and truth which has been variously defined by sources generally objectivity means that the state of quality of being true even outside of a subject's individual biases interpretations feelings and and imagines a proposition is generally considered objectively true to have an objective truth when its truth conditions are met without biases caused by feelings ideas opinions etc or sentiment or sentient 
subject. A second broader meaning of the term refers to the ability in any context to judge fairly without partially or external influence. The second meaning of object- objectivity is sometimes used uh, synonymously with neutral, uh, with neutrality. Kind of go a little bit more in depth here. Um, Objectivism is a term that describes a branch of philosophy that originated in the early 19th century. Uh, God, Godelob Berge was the first to apply it when he expounded an astrological and metaphysical theory contrary to that of Immanuel Kant. And Kant's uh, rationalism tended to direct aside the fairies he perceived in, f- in philosoph- philosophical, philosophical realism. So basically, just to kind of boil it down to... Um, <laughs> Objectivism, the activity comes comes from those 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 who come from that mindset come from the whole Ayn Rand um, department of libertarianism, if you will, or that particular wing of political thought. Um, you can take it what you will. Uh, we'll talk about Rand in a moment, but that's where um, objectivity comes from, really, when it deals with Bitcoin. And really what it is, is is a lot of people are asking you to not to have such uh, feelings or attitudes and be less emotional when when um, dealing with Bitcoin, to be very objective. And I guess you could say the way they're, they're attracted to this is because of the uh, cartography, uh, the mathematic principles, uh, the decentralized nature and the peer-to-peer of it all. Even though the human condition is a component in Bitcoin, I mean, you have to get people to utilize your system. Um, it doesn't matter how well the blockchain was created. If nobody's willing to utilize it, you know, if they don't have some form of attachment to either consistently seek to improve, build upon, utilize, then what's the point? But when it comes to those things, a lot of people, and you see their arguments, you know, they ask you to take your sentiment out of it. They ask you not to be. Sometimes you hear you hear them throw and not to be political. And we'll talk about that towards the end here. Um, we talked about it a little bit earlier in the earlier segment, but yes, you, you try to take your your personal feelings out of the matter because it's all about math. It's all about the code. You have to be you have the understanding the code, and even you sometimes see, particularly with the we talked a little bit about the. The cypherpunks, you have to code. You have to know how to code so you can't really talk about Bitcoin, which gets in the whole Bitcoin um, maxless um, concept. And we'll we'll talk about them in the uh, way of Bitcoin, if you will. But this, again, this is a type of group of people that feed into the community that makes up um, the Bitcoin space and the cryptocurrency space in general. So this comes from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. You have Libertarianism. It was his first published, I guess, 2002, with revisions going all the way up to 2014. In most general sense, libertarianism is a political philosophy that affirms the rights of individuals to liberty to acquire, keep, and exchange their holdings, and consider the protection of individual rights the primary role for the state. The entry is on libertarianism is a narrow sense of moral view that agents initially fully on, own themselves and have certain moral powers to acquire fully own themselves and have a certain moral powers to acquire property rights in external things. For excellent discussion of liberty and tradition, more generally including classical liberalism, see Goss and Mock, Barnett and Burnham. Um, those are just citing sources. Um, libertarianism can be understood as a basic moral principle or as a derivative one. This entry will focus on libertarianism as a basic natural right doctrine in the spirit of Locke, 1690, and Nasik of 1974. It will not address instrumental der- derivations such as those on the basis of rule, consequential, or killing. Okay, we'll stop there. So, you can understand how libertarianism or libertarians would come into the Bitcoin space because an individual has ownership of Bitcoin. Uh, they're the only ones that would own it because they're the only ones that have the private key and the public key. Um, and because of that power, because of the power of the private key, they they own that property. And all the little derivative markets that are being built on, the DAOs and things of that nature, are kind of the concept. Like, for example... Um, 
identity or the projects are seeking to time stamp when an ownership of a document or property or like actual property like a home or sale of a home or the um, there's a project that's seeking to do like GPS coordinates and log into uh, deeds of actual businesses and actual physical property into the blockchain so that there's a documentation that at this point in time in existence, this individual owns this piece of property. And so having that direct ownership speaks to libertarianism very strongly. And that's why you see a, a number of individuals of that streak within that particular space. Oftentimes in the community in itself, like when people get hacked or when their thefts are occurring or people get fooled by scams, um, you often hear libertarians pipe up and say that it's the responsibility of the individual to protect themselves and that they, they in essence, weren't smart enough or they got to figure things out and that's why they got duped. And so it's their responsibility and it can come across very callous. Um, I don't think they take in the fact that people can do all of the right things and still have something bad happen, still have a hack or a theft to occur, or still even get scammed. I mean, going into a business agreement and someone just absconds with a good portion of your wealth, um, even when you like actually know the person, know their physical location, know their name, all that data, and still um, get away with um, taking their funds. This has happened with a couple of um, exchanges in their collapse, collapses and such. So you'll see that a little bit of a streak. And I don't think it's very malicious. It really depends on the context and who's saying it when they say these things. Um, it just, they're very much about the individual right taking responsibility for their own actions and such. I personally... Uh, of the opinion that they think that everyone needs to be like Batman and re and have every single kind of scenario thought out, you know, always have kryptonite on them, know how to have, have those special, you know, uh, throw, you know, electronic shock, um, throw bracelets to take down flash, how to take, you know, the whole, uh, tower of Babylon scenario, how to take out, um, the justice league, if you will. And not everyone, you know, can be Batman, you know, and he can't even, even Batman himself can't think of everything. Um, he didn't see Brother Eye coming. Um, he didn't, he doesn't see a lot of things coming and you just can't, you can't plan for every single conceivable scenario and this way and that way if this and this happens, domino type of effect thing. And, but, you know, that type of ideology you know is again is drawn to the community makes what the community is and it gives us kind of diversification and again these are the type of people that are attracted to the concept of the of bitcoin so this comes from wicca uh, anarchism uh, anarchism is a political philosophy that advocates self-governed societies based on voluntary institutions they're often described as stateless societies although several authors have defined them more specifically as institutions based on non-hierarchical free association. Um, anarchism holds that the state to be undesirable, unnecessary, and harmful. So you can understand why anarchists would come to the cryptocurrency space, you know, the kind of a influence the cypherpunk them a little bit. They influence um, open source in general and peer-to-peer -peer in the sense that you don't have to have the government's permission to do what you seek and do, corporations, or any kind of hierarchical way of thinking um you as an individual can create something um get with a group of friends or a group of people share your ideas work it out everyone's kind of on an equal level um, everyone's choosing to participate and you can also disassociate if you like to and it's you know there's no one center leader or group of leaders uh, for example you know again Nobody knows who Satoshi Nakamoto is, whether it's a he or a she or a group of individuals, but he did withdraw himself from the Bitcoin community. So, in essence, is not is doesn't have a a leadership, if you will. Yes, there is Bitcoin Core, and we'll talk about that when we talk about the other guys um, and the way of Bitcoin um, when we touch on the subject of Bitcore. 
Um, those are the Big Core um, is the currently are the the set of developers that actually work on the core, uh, hence Big Core, the core code, if you will, for the big, the blockchain. Um, it is from them that the implementation of the different solutions would come from, whether it be SegWit, Lightning Network, a combination therefore. Um, even one solution uh, from one of the developers um, known as Luke uh, Jr. Um, is the uh, downgrading of the block size from one megabyte to half that, if you will. So from them that, you know, you not necessarily leadership, if you will, because once again, even though they implement the code or, or bring about the development of the code, if the miners don't approve, the no, or the nodes don't um, allow it, if the users don't want it, you can have a fork. So just because the core implements something doesn't mean that it's going to be something that can stick around. And that comes down to the whole soft fork, hard fork type of a deal, which we'll eventually get to um, through the series of episodes that we talk, as we build up to actually breaking down the whole debate in of itself or at least the technical aspects of um, the block size debate. So those are the anarchists, and then they are the ones who kind of gravitated towards the space. A lot of them, you get a lot of, you see a lot of intersectionality with a lot of the different philosophies. You know, volunteerism is a component of anarchism. Um, you also have anarchists that are a, bit, a little bit libertarians. Um, you have anarchists that are socialists, anarchists that are Marxists. Um, We'll talk about that, that that philosophy towards the end. Um, so you see a little mishmash of everyone when it comes to participating and gravitating towards Bitcoin. A little segment um, offshoot, if you will, is anarcho-capitalism. Uh, is a they're also known as libertarian anarchy or market um, anarchism or free market anarchism. Is a libertarian and individualist anarchist political philosophy that advocates the elimination of state in favor of individual sovereignty in the free market. Um, economist Murray Rothberg is credited with coining the term. In an anarcho capitalist society, law enforcement, courts, and all other security services would be provided by volunteer funded competitors such as a private defense agency rather than through taxation and money and would be privately and competitively provided in an open market. And according to anarcho capitalist personal and economic activities be regulated by natural laws of the market and through private law rather than through politics. Furthermore, victimless crimes and crimes against the state would not exist. So again, you can see why they would um, participate in the Bitcoin space. Um, it kind of speaks to them again on um, the sense that this is not being developed or handed down by the government. Uh, the blockchain technology is a way to get away from taxation, it's not coming from the government, it's not something that's being forced upon people. Uh, you can develop your own type of companies, um, services through the blockchain technology in of itself, not necessarily just with Bitcoin, but you can develop and build off of Bitcoin as a currency or build off of the blockchain technology to develop all sorts of different types of services, if you will. Uh, and then you have the Australian School of Economics. These guys mostly come from Miser, a Luden Van Mise. His theory of marginal utility, the money in his book, is the theory of money and credit, which came out in 1912. Um, so you have a lot of people that are influenced by this particular economic principle into the blockchain space. Uh, this um, definition comes from Avestopedia, which was written by Manjo Singh parsing it out here, um, an overview of the Austrian school. What we know today is the Austrian school of economics was not made in a day. The school has been gone through years of evolution in which the wisdom of one generation was passed on to the next. Though the school has progressed and incorporated knowledge from outside sources, the core principles remain the same. Uh, Karl Miner, an Austrian ag economics who wrote the principles of economics in 1871, is considered by many to be the founder of the Austrian school. The title of Minder's of book suggests nothing extraordinary, but its contents became one of the pillars of marginalist revolutions. 
Uh, Minder explained in his book that the economic values of goods and services are subjective in nature. That is, what is valuable for you may not be valuable for your neighbor. Uh, Minder further explained that with an increase in number of goods, the subjective value of an individual diminishes. The valuable insight lies behind the concept of what is called a diminishing marginal utility. Uh, later on, Ludwig van Mies, another great thinker of the Austrian school, applied the theory of marginal utility to his money in his books, The Theory of Money and Credit. The theory of diminishing marginal utility of money did in fact help us find an answer to one of those basic questions of economics. How much money is too much money? Here also is the answer can be subjective. One more extra dollar in the hands of a billionaire would hardly make a difference, although that same dollar would be invaluable in the hands of a pauper. And these guys, you know, there are a lot of theorists, a lot of their applications are applied. You know, it's it's hard, you know, with economies and, and economics philosophy. There are certain aspects that are applied, but not completely. Uh, there are certain people that develop their companies around this concept or their whole entire economic platform. But um, really what drives, I think, really um, Australian or people who of this particular mindset has to do with the whole money supply and the fact that money is being printed, you know, through quantum easement, inflation, um, those type of market manipulation. There's not really a free market in the money supply. It's in fact too high, not realistic. Debt is high, things of that nature. And so they, a lot of those people of that kind of economic thinking are gravitated, gravid, are pulled into the concept where Bitcoin is set at tw- 21 million coins. Those were the only coins that are ever can created, period. The fact that only so many coins are uh, made um, um, every six, you know, every six minutes is, you know, this transaction here in history. Uh, when a block is discovered, uh, the reward from the miners, I think, is we're at 14 per block. Let me check what the block reward is now. Okay, it's not 14. It's 12. Uh, the reward date uh, is 2020, June 24th is the next happening, which will be six coins. But of course, you know, difficulty goes up, percentage of total Mines is 7.6, which means right now there are 16 million and some change of Bitcoin in circulation. Only 21 million will ever exist. Right now, uh, Bitcoin is trading around $1,600. You know, a lot is going on here. Um, I'm just getting this information from the Bitcoin block cap. So the mark capitalization is $26 billion. Bitcoin's generated per day is like 1,700 or 1,728 Bitcoin. Bitcoin inflation rate per annum is 3.94%. Bitcoin inflation per annum at the next block halving event will be 1.73%. So a Bitcoin inflation per USD, USD, hmm, it's 2,800, or no, it's 2,828. So two, almost three million. So, you know, because there's this fixed amount, because the the, the reward for fi- finding the blockchain, if you will, um, is halved each time there is a halving, which is done every four years, I believe. Um, it allows for Bitcoin to be... Um, Immutable again, it goes back to the components and the core part of Bitcoin, but it allows for the monetary policy, if you will, of Bitcoin not to be so manipulated. Um, with these set parameters, you can't one ever increase the block size, uh, not the block size, but the block, you know, the 21 Bitcoins. You can't do that. You can't even increase the block reward, if you will. It would totally wreck. Um, the way the economy is built around Bitcoin, but most importantly, um, no one would ever go for it, but just the nature of Bitcoin in itself is supposed to be limited. There's supposed to be restrictions. It's not supposed to be so easily manipulated because someone needs money or needs to bail somebody out or anything like that. Yeah, it is every four years. So Anne Rand, 
her philosophy of, of objectivism. Uh, this is from Wicca. Uh, it's a philosophy system developed by uh, Anne Rand. Uh, she's a Russian-American writer. Rand first expressed objectivism in her fiction, most notably The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrug, and later in nonfiction essays and books. Uh, Leonard Pivkoff, a philosophy, a professional philosopher, and Rand's designated intellectual heir, later gave it a more formal structure. Uh, Pivkoff uh, characterized objectivism as a closed system that is not subject to change. Uh, Objectivism's central tenets are that reality exists independently of consciousness, that human beings have direct contact with reality through the sense perception, that one can obtain objective knowledge from perception through the process of concept formation or inductive logic, that the, pro- the proper moral purpose of one's life is the pursuit of one's own happiness or rational self-interest, uh, that only social systems consist with this morality is one that displays full respect of individual rights embodied in the laissez-faire capitalism, and the role of art in human life is to transform humans' metaphysical ideas by selective reproduction reality into physical form, a work of art then can only be comprehended and to which one can respond emotionally. Academic philosophers have mostly ignored or rejected Rand's philosophy. Nonetheless, objectivism has made significant influences among libertarians and American conservatives, uh, the objective movement, which Rand founded, tends to spread her ideas in a public and academic setting. So again, it just comes back to you know individual rights, um, no governmental interference in economics. The individual has control. They kind of go a little bit more in detail with you know the concept of what types like art forms and metaphysical and ideas. Um, in pursuit of one's happiness is rational self-interest. Um, you know, there's problems like with any philosophy with Rand and stuff like that. But again, these type of individuals, you know, they came into the space because, again, it's about, you know, with Bitcoin, again, you, you have control of your own wealth independent of that of the state or even others around you. Um, you're the one who's utilizing or utilizing it its function in the way you, you seek to do so, whether it be a miner, um, getting that um, block reward, or you can be selling Bitcoin, you can be accepting Bitcoin in your store, you can holding it. Any individual way that you seek to improve your own happiness, if you will, to improve your own wealth, is what a lot of objectives or people who follow Rand regret, you know, again, sought out bitcoin if you will and the blockchain technology to you know come into this space and work within that space if you will so lastly would be socialism and communism Um, socialism is a range of economic and social systems characterized by social ownership and democratic control of means of production as well as the political ideologies theories and movements that aim to establish them social ownership may refer to forms of public collective or cooperative ownership the citizens' ownership of, of equity or to any combination of these. Although there are many varieties of socialism, there's no single definition encapsulating, encapsulating them, all of them. Social ownership is the common element shared by its various forms. So a lot of socialists um, that might come into this space are doing so because they're rejecting and have already you know, consistently rejected the current capitalist economic system that um, governs the world economy. And so they're coming into the blockchain space as a way of developing um, the ownership of their own wealth. The fact that there is a bit of a collective nature in the usage of the blockchain technology. You know, you have the miners that have to work together, uh, the users, the nodes, the developers, the code, the wallets, the businesses, all that have to work in kind of unison and together in a sense to keep the network going or else um, Bitcoin itself would either fork or collapse or get go into disrepair or not be utilized. So communism is a political and social science. Uh, in the philosophy, social and political and economic ideology and movement whose ultimate goal is establishment of the communist society, which is a socio-economic order structured upon the common ownership of the means of production and the absence of social class, money, and state. Um, communism includes a variety of school of thought, which broadly include Marxism, um, anarchism, or anarchist communists, 
and the political ideology group around both. All these share the analysis that the current order of society stems from an economic system, capitalism, and that in this system there are two major social classes, the working class who must work to survive and who make up the majority within the society, and the capitalist class, the minority, who derive a profit from employing the working class. Through private ownership and the means of production, the conflict between these two classes will trigger a revolution. The primary element which will enable the transformation according to the analysis is the social ownership of the means of production. You know, primary anarchist communists might come into this space, but also communists in general. The fact that is a is a system that bucks the whole sense of capitalism in the sense that this is a collective effort, you know, to create and develop and make and maintain the blockchain technology. You know, miners, you can, if you put enough capital together, I guess you can be mining now. Uh, but on the initial onset, you know, anyone could mine. Uh, nodes, you can run a full node. Uh, utilizing peer-to-peer, decentralization. Uh, there's certain aspects, and I know it sounds very goofy and weird considering how market-driven a lot of people are when it comes to Bitcoin. Uh, but there are certain, you know, aspects of it, particularly the underlying blockchain technology that would draw somebody that has this particular philosophy to it. But again, um, all these different groups, and I'm sure there's more different philosophies and ideas that um, I couldn't even touch, but that it just brings into the concept that all these different groups are, are part of this space. They have a say in it. Uh, they're, you know, they're on the blogs, they're coding, they're coming up with their different solutions. Not all of it is coming from the big core. Uh, Bitcoin core seeking to address the the block size today, whether it's increasing it, decreasing it, increasing it only so much, increasing it a lot, do nothing. All these different voices, you know, seek to participate and be part of this community, develop this community, utilize Bitcoin, the blockchain technology, creating other cryptocurrency coins, the DAO or storage or utilizing, um, building off of Bitcoin. And it's from this space that, you know, this community that Bitcoin gains and increases its value through time, I think, by having a very robust community. So we'll have a little tie in the bow here with a quick synopsis of philosophy and pretty pretty much um, sum up what this episode is. So we, I have these two points, the last two points, to kind of summarize what we've been discussing about the philosophy of Bitcoin. One is a WordPress site called Bitcoin Theory. Uh, It has a pretty detailed, in-depth breakdown of the history of Bitcoin, the philosophy, the different economic viewpoints, philosophical uh, viewpoints, um, the different ways that people go about Bitcoining, if you will. And um, because we talked about the different um, groups that come into, like the anarchy, anarchists, even so that kind of like anti-capitalist, like the communists, if you will, um, we touched on a little bit, uh, volunteerism. Uh, it comes from that kind of perspective or the end of that spectrum, um, a cypherpunk spectrum, if you will, where there's there's kind of, it's very weird. And I guess uh, when I, again, I'll talk about it on a word for the metaverse, uh, the whole concept of cypherpunk punctum, if you will. Uh, but with all um, kind of uh, political ideologies, they kind of, a lot of them do mesh up and bleed together. And you have like, I guess the best way, um, as I spoke in before, before is you have these subgenres, if you will, of philosophy. Uh, but I'm not going to go through that particular site because like I said, it's very detailed. But if you want to do some additional reading or have a kind of a insight on the or a reference point on the different type of philosophies and it's pretty condensed um, I highly recommend going to Bitcoin theory but the one I'm going to read here and this will pretty much wrap up everything for us is blog post by Con- Conrad uh, Graf. This comes all the way back um, pretty much in the early days of October 20- 2013 it's called Bitcoin and Social Theory Reflections a review essay between Amsterdam and, Le- and Atlanta the German word Nachoklang denotes what resonates after a sound has passed. It is a tune that still plays in one's head after external sound has faded. I've been listening to what stays with me stays with me in a few days after attending the big 
Bitcoin European Conference in Amsterdam, which took place September 26 through 28, prior to setting out towards the Cryptocurrency Conference in Orlando, October 4th through the 5th. Many conferences have keynote addresses, and I think Bitcoin Europe has more of the keynote moment on the final days to reflect the heart of the whole affair. This came when Bitcoin Magazine editor and software developer uh, Maha Asli uh, punctuated his movie presentation with, Bitcoin is here to serve humanity, not to rule it. Now that resonates. Takeaway themes including one, the need to help to keep developing more intuitive client software, two, the desperate need to help improve the global remittance market, which Bitcoin is technically capable of revolutionizing rather quickly. I know a lot of people talk about this, this remittance market, and I have some significant issues. I've touched upon it before when a lot of these um, type of companies, it just, particularly now that we're in this kind of post-post-colonialism world where you have these, a lot of these um, emerging markets, as they're called, are countries that are emerging out of the, they are, um, they were once, you know, they were conquered, colonized by various European countries. They um, either overthrow those uh, um, countries either through a violent affair or through slow uh, attrition actions, if you will. Um, just look at India. There was a lot of violent actions, but because of the peaceful movement of Gandhi and a lot of political brinkmanship between um, um, various a- aspects of his country, you know, Britain removed itself from India, which was a colony, and then there was a breakup of Pakistan um, into its own separate country. Um, and as those that was those I was in the forties, and so as we we're going through the twentieth century, these countries were developing and making their own way, making their own policies, and getting away from the teeth of their their former masters, if you will, if you think of the relationship of colonialism for what it is. And there are some countries that still have, you know, strong ties to their, their former colonists, if you will, but as we're emerging into the 21st century, that's becoming less and less the case, and more and more these countries are standing on their own, they are making their own economic way, making their own policies, divorcing themselves in many ways completely from any sense of their previous uh, colonial laws, um, culture, attributes, all that type of business. And this whole remittance thing, if you will, uh, just because the global market in itself is very westernized, they're the ones who develop it, deployed it, dominate it. Um, it's just very strange that when everyone talks about the unbanked, they go to global remittance with, instead of maybe going within their own, um, because it's, because most of uh, Bitcoiners are within the Western world or within the first world, if you will, are not going out to the unbanked within their own countries. People that do not have bank accounts for a lot of reasons um, are living to paycheck to paycheck and not implementing a financial structure that could insist and help and even test out the concepts um, that people talk about when it comes to and enabling and um, allowing for people to self-actualize and control their own wealth. But they're going to the remittance market. And the country in the countries that have had successful Bitcoin remittance markets are not um, countries that have had companies that come into it from a Western place. There are, con- there, there are countries like Kenya, um, the Philippines, um, Indonesia, that it developed from within their own community. Um, of course, they still have ties because of the banking infrastructure, and we'll talk about that with uh, later on after Bitcoin's a mess. I guess we have to talk about it, about the whole closing the loop and the whole fiat tied to Bitcoin. I'll figure out which episode I'll place that in. But the, the ones that have been extremely successful are the ones that are coming out of those countries, out of those places, back into the Western world and, and being successful in that way instead of the Western world coming in and fixing their their remittance market, if you will, instituting their concept of what a new financial system should be. It's just very weird, very patri- patriarchal, patrilineal. Oh, it's just very bizarre and not the most open-minded thinking, I think, when it comes to the global remittance. But I have digressed. Uh, three. 
The need to implement multiple signature transactions in client software. While the last item may seem obscure, we will return below to its potential immense long-term implications. Uh, the conference was heavy on entrepreneurs and programmers, often combined with the same person, Bitcoin, J, developer, and smart contractor. Enthusiast Mark Kern could easily be spotted in the lobby talking with someone while looking over a screen of code on his laptop. Massive effort, energy, and ingenuity in his play with untold separate projects in the way. One person of the other I talked to or who was present was working on some project to develop new wallets, improve existing wallets, develop new exchanges, develop new ways to do exchanging, other ways to you do remittance and loans, incubate startups, and generally make payments easier and more accessible and secure for wider audiences. This most definitely includes all those underserved, misserved, or not served at all by the world's existing constellation of financial institutions. So we'll touch about on um, other aspects of this article. Um, I just wanted to get into like his initial statement of what was stated by um, uh, by Mail as a that Bitcoin's here to serve humanity and not to rule it. Um, the article also touch on, and we'll talk about it later, um, in different aspects of this whole entire series. You know, the, the tragedy of international remittance is covered here. The ecosystem metaphor. Regulation is a much broader social problem. A quick interlude on privacy and many in today's DPPR arrests. Uh, so again, this was written in 2013. So that was very new. So here, the rise of social theories. It was a pleasure at the conference to finally meet Peter Shadur, a longtime Bitcoin researcher, also influenced by the Austrian school approach to economics, began taking its modern forms at the University of Vienna in the 1870s. Um, we talked about them when we talked about the various groups that were um, gravitating to Bitcoin. When I started researching Bitcoin, he, his was among the first names began rising towards the top of discussion forum soup as I began to think about the monetary nature of Bitcoin. He quickly made it into my initial knows what he's talking about shortly. Even better, it's a bit of a relief and an encouragement to me working in early March to notice that he had independently arrived at the same interpretation of the relationship between Bitcoin and traditional monetary classification that were quite similar to the ones I was initially entertaining. Peter also told a story about our meeting in this quick post of highlights from the conference. Um, he has a link, so you can read that for yourself. One of my favorite short books on monetary theory is the Ec- Ethics of Money Production by Gorge Gudio Holzman. When I asked Peter if he had read it, he said yes, twice. I laughed and said I also read it twice. What an unusual moment that the global population of people who have done this and attended a Bitcoin conference must still be rather small indeed. Another time, Peter and I were half-joking about the proper role of economics in the cryptocurrency revolution. He said the first response of many Economists to the Bitcoin seems to be denial. Bitcoin is not real and it will fail shortly, just like other half, other harebrained funny money schemes throughout history. We have seen plenty of the, the that denial phase, many for people who do not seem to have investigated technology all that much. My informed empirical generalization is the knowledge of Bitcoin and the fascination with or enthusiasm about Bitcoin tend to correlate strongly, as do technical ignorance of the subject and an easy a categorical dismissal. Notice that we expect matters to be exactly opposite to this when it comes to unsound schemes. In such cases, the more one investigates, the less there is the like, whereas most of the enthusiasts seem to have been swayed by the hype, surface appearance, and may even be unwilling to actually look much deeper. The opposite denial, the main role of economists and legal and other social theorists, more generally should be to carefully observe what is happening to the real world, and to seek to provide systematic theoretical interpretations. It is the entrepreneurs who rule and service of consumers who really rule through their buying choices. It is the econo- economists who should be running along either behind or the best next to three next to these real actors and trying to figure out what is happening in a theoretical or more systematic way and adding some insights in and if they can. This is especially so when the economy is a mis event epoch scale revolution as in agricultural industrial and informational the spanish late scholars observed economic transfer- transformation in trade and money become among the first to start writing insightful and about specifically economic theory and monetary theory concepts some 500 years ago later first hand out observers and participants in industrial revolutions most famously smith and more commonly say togart 
uh, Bastille and others began to make further advances or sometimes regresses, but still on top of their observations of new developments. And comets do have their rightful place. This is evident during the conference, and thankfully only a few times when specialists in other fields edge over into the proper territory of economic theory and the average quality of their casual claims, then decline precipitously compared to when they were discussing, say, business, contemporary positive law, or software. This is not to call weave everything to specialists, but a call for everyone to take steps to advance and improve their own literacy in real economics, as Luden van Mies wrote near the end of the trademark Human Action and Treaties on Economics in 1949. Economics cannot remain an esoteric branch of knowledge accessible only to a small group of scholars and specialists. Economics deals with the society's fundamental problems. It concerns everyone and belongs to all. It is the main and proper study of every citizen. So that's, I'm going to read this other little bit about what theorists theorize and doers do. And then I'll come back to this point about Miser and the initial quote here and try to tie everything up into a bow. Uh, let theorists theorize and doers do. The world is upside down to the extent that so-called economics occupy positions of administrative power and influence over their fellows to guide economies. A euphemism for micromanaging and telling entrepreneurs and consumers what to do and what not to do. The result is a mixed-up economy world we inhabit. The world that is perhaps most mixed-up of all is when they comes to conventional financial systems. The world's most reorientated when economists are positioned as theorists and theoreticians, helping people understand how it is that the uniquely human capacity or human capabilities of volunteer social cooperation and mutual service make social make society possible. Economists can help clarify the puzzle of the world in unique ways. They should observe and bring clarity what is otherwise a mysterious chaos of real-world progress as it unfolds at the hands of consumers, investors, and entrepreneurs. Economics is supposed to be a science, not a presumptive license to micromanage and direct those who are busy doing the actual work. For those who do choose to specialize in, in economics and other aspects of social theory, do they offer some amazing opportunities to occupy front row seats to an epoch-scale transformation of technologies and market exchange? Previous uh, epochological epochological Previous word I cannot say, economic revolutions happen over centuries and decades, recognizable mostly only in, res- in retrospect. This one appears to be having, happening over a few years with increments measured in months, weeks, and even days. At Bitcoin Europe, the entrepreneurs and developers were the stars. This is the world as it should be, and Rawls is theorists that few of us were observing in awe, wonder, and curiosity. Following a major social evolution, live as it unfolds. In the particular role, playing other roles in addition might double as good research. We operate first from curiosity to understanding for observed for ourselves and only then to see if we can help make it easier for others to do the same. Atlanta Prophet promises to offer a slightly different mix still with discussions of entrepreneur, entrepreneurship and concrete innovation, but with a little more direct material economic and and contract theory in addition. Some of the original visions that help uh, help give rise to Bitcoin has, have much more unrealized promise to bring for the benefit of us all. For all the signs put up in the gloomy dim, dis, dismay of the course of conventional financial world, which effectively says the end is near, we who track promise new innovation need to keep putting up other signs in different places that add a counterpoint. The beginning is here. So again, all of this ties into really a consistence no matter what the philosophy of a person was what gravitate the gravitated to the bitcoin uh whether it was um you know anarchy uh cypherpunctum uh, the philosophy of miser austrian politics or just the fact that not even understanding any of these economic or social approaches but just understanding that when 2008 happened and there was a global collapse and seeing that not only was their personal wealth diminish, um, those around them, their wealth diminished and seeing the forecast to where their potential wealth has halved or fourth or significantly diminished depending on your, your existing economic status or even your generational status. You know, millennials currently as it's before this was, after this was written and currently at this time are at half majority of them are at half of the economic power that their parents were 
and are significantly less at the economic power of their grandparent. They do not have the same um, milestones that previous generations have. They're not owning homes. They're not getting married for a lot of different social reasons, but that status is not achieved. Like basically the owning of property, owning of cars. And some of that might be factored in the fact that transportation, the concept of, you know, ride sharing has come to existence with more um, millennials living in actually in the urban environment environments, whether the transportation, like the public transportation is successful or not, whether it's subways or trains or buses or a combination thereof, uh, being utilized, riding your bike, walking, uh, seeking alternatives. There's still the fact of the matter is that they, they're not owning the concept of the property of cars, um, being able to own their own business because they're saddled with, um, debt from school, um, medical debt, even with the passage, at least here in the States of, um, Obamacare that has reduced that a lot for a lot of people, um, prior to, what was that passed? 2010? Prior to that, um, you could have easily obtained a significant amount of debt that doesn't get cleared necessary, um, through bankruptcy. Um, bankruptcy laws have changed. I uh, used to be able to clear a lot of stuff out of bankruptcy, and that's not the case any longer. They've gotten really, really strict upon about that. So a lot of the significant key factors that motivated people come from all these different places. And what they're seeking to do, the idea is a better existence for not only themselves, but for others as well. And that's why there's all these different types of developments. Um whether the developments are, you know, actually good code or uh, great code or implemented properly or anything like that. The overwhelming intent, if you will, is to seek to do better in this financial structure than previous generations have done. To take this as an opportunity to allow for a better financial existence for all. And this is a very, when it boils down to the, the whole concept of Bitcoin, it's a very egalitarian egalitarian idea and so the the statement um which is very key here you know miser statement just highlight the, the best part i think of, of it you know economics deals with society's fundamental problems it concerns everyone and belongs to all and this is bitcoin is a, a solution to that it deals with everyone's fundamental economic problem to be able to control their own wealth and finally, again, Bitcoin is here to serve humanity, not to rule it. And that's what makes it in a glad, in a glad, ugh, again, not been able to say that word the entire episode. And got an idea for all. So that's it for this episode. This is um, the first part of the series of episodes that are covering the block size debate. The series in itself, I'm calling it uh, Bitcoin's a Messy Bitch. Uh, this is the first part dealing with philosophy. The next episode is going to deal with BIP, which is the, the software implementation GitHub code that allows for um, the Bitcoin code in itself to change, um, how that came to existence, who developed it, and all the different BIPs that people keep talking about. Uh, then, then we're going to talk about the other guys, the other guys that have contributed to um, Bitcoin besides Satoshi Nakamoto. And then um, the business of Bitcoin, the businesses that are revolve around Bitcoin, the types of businesses, and some of the names that people have thrown out there um, in the discussion of the uh, block size debate, and so on and so forth. But those are the, the more recent upcoming episodes. So we're going to talk about BIP, the other guys in business. Thank you so much for listening. Um, and to the moon. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you and until next time. This has been a Rosha Shine Space Odyssey Network production.